Hallo, herzlich willkommen bei Folge 28 von Café Stillpoint. Uh, I will continue in English right away because I understand that our guest speaker of tonight, he brought some of his friends along and they might not speak, uh, they might not speak German. So welcome everybody. Uh, bienvenue. Uh, buenas tardes, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to have you here with, with us on our program. We have been... Uh, doing live streamings like that ever since the COVID lockdown started, uh, looking for something interesting to do, looking for keeping up the contact with our osteopathic colleagues and friends in the country, but also internationally. I'm happy to announce uh, today's speaker, Rafael Zegara Parodi, with a very interesting subject. Rafael, he has uh, studied osteopathy in the UK And then come, uh, he came back to France and there he worked, he worked for a long time for CISO Paris. And he always was the research person. And we, we met on, on several conferences and several meetings, had, uh, had uh, se some interesting discussions now. And uh, the, then Raphael moved on and to go to Kirksville uh, to the AT Still Research Institute of, of Brian Degenhardt at, at Kirksville uh, College of Osteopathic Medicine to do research there for a while and came back to, to Europe eventually. And, and now he's back in Paris where he's working as an, as an osteopath in his practice, but still he's involved very much with research. He's still a fellow of the AT Still uh, Research Institute, but he also is involved with Francesco Ceritelli's CAM collaboration. He's a member of the board of trustees there. So one of the few osteopathic colleagues who have got a wide background in research and who are also producing research. And recently, more recently, in, in, in the past, uh, Raphael did a lot of research on palpation, but recently he turned to a more historical topic, uh, and that is the influence of American natives in, uh, on Andrew Taylor Still, on his philosophy, and on, also on his practice, on, on technique, on, on, and also on what we are doing today. In a first uh, episode tonight, in a first, in a part one, uh, we will look at, he, he will tell us about the historical roots, about these contexts. And next week on Wednesday, we will uh, move along from that. We, we will take that further and look at to modern neurosciences and how they would confirm some of the native Indian and native American models and practices. And it, I think it's a really exciting topic because the, uh, the issue of consciousness often gets uh, neglected. And I think it's a really important factor in the way we deal with patients and in healing. Welcome, Raphael. Uh, really great to have you here with us tonight. Hi, Raymond. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for this nice uh, introduction. I'm really glad to be with you and share some of our last uh, pieces of, of research and how these, uh, those, those historical aspects may inform modern osteopathic practice. Mm -hmm. how, how were the last couple of weeks for you personally? How did you spend the lockdown in Paris? I was, was quite nice because I had a lot of work uh, at home and I was uh, working at my uh, practice as well. Uh, obviously, with, 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 I've been working in, the, in the, the French recommendation on how to adapt to uh, the, uh, the adapt of practice to, for risk management. Mm -hmm. uh, because obviously, this is a new disease and there's a lot of fear. But we, as a first contact practitioner, this is something we used to deal with. It's like uh, spinal manipulation on the cervical neck. We don't We, we need to assess the risk and act accordingly. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why I, I, I've been in, in, in practice uh, during the, the past couple of weeks. Did, did, did you actually treat COVID cases? No, no, no. no. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I was remaining in my, in my private practice. So, uh, and if they were, I, I wasn't aware. So, you know, because uh, <laughs> half of the patient, they don't have symptoms. So, yes. Uh, and so, again, that's 
it's risk management. So we know there's a there's a very um, people that are at higher uh, risk of for severe uh, disease. So this type of of people, we try to to give them a remote information on, or and try to avoid to have them traveling to the coming to the, to the practice. So yes. there's a lot of things we can do with telehealth, for example. Mm -hmm. A a lot of a, a, a lot of people complained and saying one and it seemed one of the biggest problem were that they could not go to the hairdressers. What do you think about that? Yeah, that was a real concern for me, as you can <laughs> see, and you too. <laughs> Uh, I never had a problem getting the haircut I want any day of the week. Yeah, <laughs> but that that that's true because one of one thing is that the social distanciation, you know, because the hairdressers people they can talk a lot, and uh, we obviously we don't we don't do that, but we have a psychosocial uh, role, and not just fixing bones and treating muscle muscle pain. The the way. This, this musculoskeletal pain interact with their social behaviors has a lot of impact. And that's why, in a sense, uh, Ed Racer was a real lack mm -hmm. for many, many people. That, 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 that's an important aspect, the, 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 so, the social thing and the, the, the ability to talk to someone at length. Good, good yeah. point. When did all when did this aspect of communication and when did when did these soft sides of osteopathic treatment when did this become important for you well it's related to this uh, the topic of of, of, of tonight um, because um, I've started uh, um, mainly focusing on treating bodies. You know, even mm -hmm. if we claim that we are osteopaths, we have a holistic approach. I would say the first 15 years of my practice was mainly musculoskeletal treatment, and I was happy with that. With that, my patients were happy, and so I'm not judging that one type of mm -hmm. treatment is better than the other one. But you know, when you're getting older. You get to kind of life experiences, mm -hmm. and you can treat and you you change and the patient change. So I was I'm more treating person rather than body. So mm -hmm. obviously um, I'm much more uh, interested in how treatment may impact the the psychosocial life and a lot of uh, ends of uh, mm -hmm. aspects. And all those are related to the osteopathic principle. So I would say I'm, I'm more aware of the the, the, the powerful um, the power of the osteopathic principles could have on, on how to apply them uh, to, to my patients. I think you you've, you have a presentation prepared for tonight. Let's, yes. Let's try to have 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 a look at your slides and and. To hear your story about Native American influence, uh, I think we got already. We already got them prepared. Uh, let me let me just ask. Okay. The, uh, yes. Now we got the first slide up. Okay, so you can see slides perfectly. We can see the slides, and we can see you in in the lower left corner. Okay, perfect. So I can start if you want. So. Yes, please. Okay. So, like we've discussed before, I would probably prefer to have more interaction. So uh, if you can see um, some questions in the chat, do not hesitate to interrupt me because I can, it's a, it's a large overview of what can be uh, discussed. And depending on the audience, I can certainly uh, be much more specific. Thank you for offering that. We will okay, thank you. monitor the, the questions in the chat. So everyone out there, uh, please feel free to uh, type your questions. We will have an eye on them and, and read them to Raphael. Okay, danke. So Good let's question. go. Um, so first, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, myself. I am Raphael. And for those who don't, don't know me, um, I have two different passports and two nationalities. So I'm French and I'm Peruvian. And I would say I have a Western uh, 
uh, brain and a much more traditional uh, brain. Um, here you can see that's the web page of the AT Steel Research Institute. I'm not sure if you can recognize me. So I'm very familiar with all this uh, Western approach of uh, treating patients, evidence-based medicine and, um, and uh, applying, uh, applying evidence. So I, I'm, I'm familiar with that and I like that. And here on this picture that it was me uh, last year. So I was in uh, Ucalpa, uh, it's in the Peruvian rainforest on the Ucayali River. And I was just about to travel for a two week uh, retreat uh, among a Shipibo uh, tribe. So that was my personal uh, aspect. So as a patient uh, seeing shamans, I've seen many, many things that can that are very similar to what we are doing uh, in osteopathy. So that's my two uh, cognitive bias, okay? Uh, this Western uh, modern evidence-based approach of medicine and this traditional approach of medicine are both uh, orienting my practice as an osteopath. And uh, I'm registered with the General Osteopathic Council in the UK, so, and I'm, um, I respect uh, their uh, osteopathic standards of practice, uh, because I think this is very important um, to have limits, because uh, by definition, if you cross the limits, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult. So at the end, uh, the, the, the topic of, of uh, this uh, uh, tonight uh, talk, first, uh, uh, maybe um, at, by the end we should be able to critically appraise those historical aspects of steels among the Shoni, something I was not aware of before. Um, we could compare the different uh, principles, uh, the traditional um, Native American and shamanic healing practices, osteopathic principles and modern Western allopathic principles. And by the end, we should be able to critically appraise the Native American heritage in osteopathic principles. Um, so, uh, osteopathic principles, um, oh, I'm sorry, I see you, I can't, okay. Um, this is still himself never said, uh, describe osteopathic principles. You know, it, it has been decided uh, after his death in order to organize uh, education. And there's a kind of evolving principles, you know, so mainly in 1922, 53 and 2002, there's a kind of evolution. This interesting thing is that in the revised tenets of osteopathic medicine, you can see this one, very important stating that the person, the person is a product of a dynamic interaction between body mind and spirit. And if you look at the scientific literature in a different publication, there's only two healing traditions that explicitly state that they are using um, this body, mind, spirit uh, paradigm is the shamanic profession and the osteopathic profession. So my question, where does that come from? So as I I said, um, I have my uh, scientific cognitive bias, and whether we like it or not, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, to give you a couple of information that I'm sure a lot of people in the profession are already aware of. The only thing we have done is to publish it. It, 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 it means to, to have a peer reviewing process, and all the, the, the information that are going to follow are from this paper that was published uh, last November uh, in the International Journal of Osteopathic Medicine. So that's the Native American heritage of the body-mind-spirit paradigm in osteopathic principles and practices. So as you have said, tonight we will focus more on the principle and next week on the practices. And so uh, I, am, I have co-authored this paper with friends of mine, Jerry, who is a doctor in osteopathy, a very um, uh, bright and smart uh, guy and focused on the BPS model. And uh, Francesco, you've just talked about him, he's a neuroscientist 
And uh, we'll see next week that there's a lot of things in, in, in neuroscience that can be used to describe this, um, this type of, uh, uh, of treatment. And Jason Exton, he's a, the director of the Museum of Osteopathic Medicine, and he sent me um, and, and the, a lot of materials that we are describing in, the, in our paper, and I'm going to show you right away. I, so I, I love uh, I love Jason. He he he's so excited about osteopathic history, and he's so happy if if people come around who are who are interested as well. And he's yeah. so willing to share what he's got. It's it's wonderful. So I can certainly refer. He has just done two different uh, presentations, very specifically on this Native American heritage. So I can certainly refer to his presentation for people who would like more details. Again. I'm an osteopath, so I'm not an historian, I'm not a neuroscientist, I'm, I can uh, bring some information in order to orient uh, the way uh, we can help our patients with osteopathy. So basically, uh, in his um, autobiography, um, he described that he spent almost, uh, around two years uh, among a Shawnee tribe at the Wakarusa mission, and something very uh, important that, that blew my mind that it was uh, is a picture and there's a handwritten note uh, at the bottom of this picture and the, it's written, uh, A.T. still himself, himself wrote Okonetowa, that is the Shawnee word for doctor. So we'll discuss that later, but he was considered, the, again, I'm not an historian, but this is a question that remained unanswered. Was he considered um, as a doctor, I mean, a Native American healer or a shaman? Or because there was only one single word to describe doctor and he was trained as a Western doctor, the, the Shawnee gave him, gave, gave, gave him this, this, um, this, um, this word. Just a quick... Uh, um, overview of the of who the Shawnee tribe were, one of the many uh, tribe, native tribe. Uh, so there, the interesting thing uh, is that, so the Wakarusa mission were still um, spent two years of his life among them, is here, just across uh, the Missouri River at the border between Missouri and Kansas. For people who are not aware, Kirksville is around here. Okay, so it's very close. So, and interesting thing is that um, the Shawnee were already deported. Okay, that's one, one treaty that the Shawnee had with the, um, the, the, the Americans. And exactly like the, all the, uh, the, Trony, none, the, the treaties, none of them were respected. Okay, the Americans, they have stolen their lands and it's kind of uh, destroying their culture throughout, throughout the year. So still was among them for, for, for two years. And one question is, to what extent was he familiar with their way of uh, treating patients, the way of their cosmogony, the, the, how they feel they, 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 they understand the, all the, the living things uh, in, in, uh, in nature. That's a few of the pieces uh, available. Um, again, coming from the materials from the Museum of Osteopathic Medicine. One interesting thing is that steel used a blanket, a, a native blanket to treat uh, his people. So this is a Navajo blanket, and um, he used to, to, to put it on his uh, uh, OMM table. And on this uh, picture, uh, this woman was pregnant, and uh, I think it's very small, but still himself called the child, he gave the, the child um, a Shawnee name, Namate, which is the the Shawnee name for fish. And uh, he was familiar with the Shawnee uh, language. He was able to speak 
and to write the Shawnee language. So it was not just a, a Western uh, medical doctor uh, living with them. He shared absolutely all their tradition. And one very interesting thing is that it's a letter written by her daughter, Blanche Steele. Uh, Blanche Steele, she was, never had any interaction with the Shawn. She was born in Kirksville, 20 years after um, uh, Steele and his family moved away from the Wakarusa mission. And at the end of her life, Blanche was able to, to write Shawnee, and she had a stroke, and she was able to speak only Shawnee. She was not able to speak English anymore. This means that for Andrew Taylor's year, the Shawnee um, culture was very important because he taught his own children to speak and to write the, the Shawnee. So it probably had a, a profound impact on his, on his life. Again, something important is obviously uh, Jason is the most appropriate person to describe all the influences that uh, still had uh, on, on when, when you describe the, uh, the, the osteopathic profession. And I just want to point out that among all the, those influences, only the Native American is missing. So the topic of tonight is to talk about this, but obviously he made a, his own mix with all different backgrounds, all different cultures, and I'm just uh, explaining basically uh, what is the, the what the missing part is, and this is very important. And this is a uh, so is uh, is blanket Navajo blanket, and obviously there's a different type of uh, interpretation. Like I said, was he a Okonetowa like a, a doctor? Because there's one single word. It could mean he was a shaman as well, and some people may believe that, or he was just a Western doctor. Uh, very well accepted living among the Shawnee. To me, today for my patients, it, it does it, that it, it doesn't it doesn't matter. The most important it's a work for historian and I'm not an historian. The only thing we know for sure is this type of tools, you can't buy them. You don't have stores for shamans. Okay? It's a gift from one shaman to another shaman, from one traditional healer for another traditional healer. We don't know the way he was using this tool. Probably, maybe it was just for having his patient more comfortable on his wooden table, probably, or probably he was using that for different uh, purpose. It's, it's not my job. I'm just giving information and historian for sure have, will have the appropriate methodology to, to give to start giving some pieces of answers. So what about the key Native American healing principles? Again, I'm not a, I'm not a Native, but I'm familiar with um, traditional healing because of my personal backgrounds and my personal experiences among the Shi people, but as a patient, okay, not as a healer. So I can understand and uh, so basically, we'll, we'll see that uh, in more details probably uh, next time, but um, the traditional healers, they are described two different types of reality, the ordinary realities and the reality and the non-ordinary reality, the, where, where people are in modified state of consciousness. So basically, all they, they have a lot of rituals and if we try to describe those in a more in physiological ways, basically they're putting the body into high physiological stress, uh, whether for Native American or for or whatever uh, traditional medicine, it's always the same principles, okay? People, they are fasting for days, or it could be with pain, high dose of pain, um, and then the, the, the brain shifts from the ordinary to the non-ordinary um, uh, state. It could be drumming, repetitive drumming, but it's not just 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Sometimes it can last for hours or for days. So 
um, again, it's, it's always the same process, moving that, uh, moving patients, and from ordinary state to altered state of consciousness, then the shaman or the traditional healers give the information and then the patient returns to the normal state and he becomes ill. That's the main belief that we can see in all tradition, all different tradition. One specific aspect of the Native American healing tradition is the medicine wheel. You know, the body, mind, we can see that, body, mind, spirit, emotions. And you can see that the body, mind, spirit may be linked to this uh, medicine wheel. Again, it's just our assumption. When I say or is the, the people who have uh, written this, uh, this paper. I'd like to say again that, and we'll see that in a, in a minute. So obviously we were four people uh, co-authoring this paper, but I have been held by three other people that I wanted to remain uh, discreet. Those people were a medicine man from the Lakota tribe and medicine men from the Shawnee tribe, because I asked them, I have asked them to review the content and make sure that um, it was appropriate to share this type of information, even if it's peer reviewed and I put this, uh, all these type of references you can check and you will get a lot of information. But why? Because this is sacred medicine. It's a very specific uh, way and I'd like to make, I, I just wanted to make sure that uh, it, we had a respectful approach and find the, the good combination between um, giving um, historical information, contextual information about um, cultural information about what still could have uh, discovered, what type of uh, treatment he may have been, he may have received when he was living among the, the show. So that's the that's the, the, the table that I've, we have used to compare the different uh, principles. Uh, again, this is our assumption, and this is the way we understand or we describe or we see osteopathic principle. On the right side, we have principles arising from the modern Western um, medicine, obviously, allopathic medicine, on the left side, we have the traditional Native American and shamanic healing practices. And in the middle, we have, osteop we have osteopathic principles. So again, this is just our way of uh, interpreting all this kind of uh, information. Excuse and me, Raphael. It, it, it seems we have the first couple of questions. Okay, uh, good. I'll, can, can you read them uh, or, or should we read them to you? I can't uh, see anything else than my okay. presentation. So if you can tell me the question, I could answer. Yes. Um, all treatment is done in an overnormal way. Frage oder ein Statement? There is a question whether uh, all treatment is done in an uh, overnormal state or in a uh, non-ordinary state of mind? For, 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 for well, yes. Is, is, this a, is this about, we don't know if this is about shamans or if this is about osteopath. It's oh, this was only for shamans. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll, we'll put that later uh, to, to the best of my, of my knowledge, obviously. So that's one key difference is we treat patients in ordinary reality, okay? There's no need to put uh, physiological stress to treat, to treat patients. So, um, and thank you, thank you for the question, because if it wasn't clear, <laughs> was, mm -hmm. it's very important to say that. So, uh, so our vision is sometimes osteopathic principle is at the border between traditional principles and modern principles. Sometimes it's more 
related to modern principles and sometimes it's more related to traditional uh, principles. And that's why we have uh, so many osteopaths tra uh, working so differently because we have a wide range of, uh, for a scope of practice. Some are very close to musculoskeletal uh, practice with using biopsychosocial approach, a lot of ends of, and it's fine. And other have less emphasis on all these EBM uh, stuff and more related to an intuitive approach of treating, treating patients. So this may be, at least for me, and I hope for, for, the, for, the, for the readers and for the, for the people tonight, it kind of gave us a, a framework where we could uh, exactly describe what we are doing in depending on the, the representation of our, of our profession whether osteopaths feel them more close or more related to modern practice or more to traditional practice. So um, you can see that if we have a look at the, uh, at the, the approach, obviously there's a reductionist approach in the modern medicine and uh, the dynamic interaction, the holistic approach we have in osteopathy is more related to the traditional uh, um, traditional uh, heritage. Uh, modern medicine, the emphasis on disease and curing, and emphasis on health and harmony for uh, traditional uh, medicine. And osteopathy in between, obviously we focus, we, and there's an emphasis on health, but we focus on the musculoskeletal system function to resist disease processes. Again, that's our vision and very this profession at the border of two different um, approach of, of treating patients. So if we have a look again at this reductionist approach, so we use a biomedical framework. So it's a linear approach, symptoms, diagnosis, treatment, and it works very well when you have a disease, when, you have a, when there's a treatment, when there's a vaccine, it works very well. But if we have a look at medical and explained symptoms on functional, it, it doesn't work so, so, so well. So that's why the, the osteopathic profession is more within a biopsychosocial framework. And it, it's in, in between, between the, the, this reductionist biomedical approach and this, uh, the, the, this, this tribal belief of health and illness of, of people belonging to uh, their environment. Again, uh, this is something that we all know, the uh, modern Western medicine, they honor physician for curing, traditional medicine honors, traditional medicine and osteopathy, exactly the same, honors the patients for the maintenance of health and recovery from disease. Preventative medicine, okay, bio, again, biomedical framework, biopsychosocial framework, and not a, a community framework. So it's just to give you um, a, an, an example on how we see those principles, but we need really to pay attention because all of these aspects, they are taken off their uh, very specific geographical a cultural context. For example, I'm here in Paris in my practice. If I think about nature, I will probably think about a forest or something. But when I'm in the rainforest, I don't think about nature. I am, I know, I feel in my own body that I am part of nature. So that's why we really need to, to pay attention on to what extent we can use this type of information and uh, use them within our um, modern, uh, modern, modern way, modern framework. So this is very, the, the, this, this uh, model, the Kinefin model, uh, this is a paper that was published last year by uh, Christian Lange and Francesca Baroni, and this was very, very uh, helpful and powerful for me, because as I've said, there's a very wide 
uh, range of practice, large scope of practice in osteopathy. How can we make sense about all of these things? I, you know that people are spending a lot of time to get diagnosis, active movement, passive movement, or biopsychosocial, and other people, they don't ask any question, they just ask people to lie down, touch the hand, touch the hand and contact, and patients are happy. So this kinefin model, so there's a, different ways to uh, interpret it. So basically, at the, the right, you have the analytical, analytical system, and the left, the intuitive system. Okay, so it's different ways of, uh, of uh, interpreting uh, those osteopathic principles. I would say those, the right part is more related to the Western way of interpreting uh, osteopathy, and the left part is more a traditional uh, interpretation uh, of uh, osteopathic practice. I would say my uh, own personal journey as an osteopath, I moved from this part, the simple domain, perceiving, categorizing, and responding, to more complicated domain, to more complex domain, then to the chaotic domain. We act, we perceive, and we respond at the same time. Okay, so obviously, uh, this is not for, um, it's, it's just a way of describing what I've just said. Some people need a very uh, specific approach, some practitioners, and with um, experience uh, as a professional, or with experience as human, we can feel more empathy and more um, things that related to the, to, the, to the psychosocial system. So that's, that's the way for me, that was the way for me, very, very powerful model in order to make sense of all this uh, complexity. Uh, that's uh, second, second, that I would say, that's the first paper we've published with Jerry and Francesco, and we've proposed this Body mind spirit uh, paradigm within the biopsychosocial model, especially all these um, those aspects related to the spiritual dimension in health. Why? Because we know that uh, basically um, people who believe in oneness, um, just whatever the religion, whatever the belief, whatever the spirituality, basically people believe that they belong to something bigger than themselves. These people, they have uh, much better scores at uh, life satisfaction, quality of life. They have different uh, behaviors. They have less risk behaviors. So this type of, that's why the spiritual dimension in, in health as a direct and indirect implication on the physical dimension. And this may be uh, important for a musculoskeletal therapist. So that's why we've proposed uh, them to add for an additional uh, risk factor, an additional flag, uh, being the, 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 the spiritual dimension, uh, like a prognosis factor uh, that could limits uh, the progression of, of, the, of, 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 of treatment. So that was the part of the, um, mainly what, what we'd like to, to, to show you about the, those principles. And obviously, uh, as an osteopath, the patients, they came to us, they are, they are in pain, they are suffering, and they don't care about principles, but they, it has a, those principles as a direct impact on, on our osteopathic practice. We have um, split those into three parts. The first related to the therapeutic alliance, second to osteopathic diagnosis, especially those related, the links between perception and palpation and osteopathic techniques. And the very important things, because in the last two or three years, there are uh, a lot of, uh, lot. there are, couple of um, fMRI uh, studies in neuroscience and that's why Francesco is very helpful on that and his paper on interoception, uh, interoceptive was 
is fantastic because it opens a wide range of uh, of uh, new models of interpreting what we're doing in, um, in in osteopathy. So basically, when I when I read a scientific papers on musculoskeletal um, approach, when I read scientific papers on in ethnography medicine or in uh, brain processing, they are all talking about the same um, brain area. They are talk, talking about all the, the same system, the multisensory integration between interoception, exteroception, and proprioception. And we are trying to make sense of that. I know Francesco is mad at me because, you know, when I see, he's a neuroscientist, I'm not a neuroscientist. So I don't have the, the scientific background to see, well, because I can see this part of the brain in this paper and the same part of the brain in another paper, obviously I can make the connection. Well, I, I would make, he, he told me, it's not that simple. So <laughs> I'm just giving, I'm just bridging gaps, okay? Making people all together with a, and, and, and this is fantastic because the, the, it's, the name is not here, but the Van Elk and Alleman paper, they have proposed uh, a, a new model for the spiritual aspects of, of the brain. So basically when the brain is put under physiological stress, the brain creates hallucination. Okay, he has new information, information that he's never dealt with before. He's creating something new. And this is basically used, uh, or at least this is what is described uh, by people who are under any shamanic, shamanic treatment. They say, oh, I had a hallucination. This is why this is very scary. But with my cognitive bias of scientist, if we can have a neuroscience model in neuroscience, it's not, it's no more magic. Okay. It's not just uh, a fluffy theory. This becomes into the physiology. And if it, it turns to become into the physiology, we can describe this, we can reproduce it and we can talk about, about this type of model. So that's my main area of interest right now. So obviously, We'll have uh, more time uh, next time to discuss about this, uh, this, uh, those much more uh, pragmatic sides on how can we use this type of uh, influence into osteopathic practice. So this is the picture I was shot last when I, when I returned to Kersville last uh, November and Jason was uh, kind enough to let me see all those uh, and touch all those, these uh, materials. So I'd like to thank, obviously, the Brian Degenhardt, who was my director at the ATST Research Institute. That was a kind of a funny journey, you know. I have spent two years as a scientist. I didn't care about anything that's science. And then I was returning uh, last November with a totally different uh, mind, more focused on those cultural and historical aspects. So I'd like to thank Jason Exton and the Museum of Osteopathic Medicine as well for giving us the, the permission to, to, to share all these documents. Obviously the COM collaboration, because we are creating a new department, uh, the Embodies Department, so that's an acronym for Emotion, Mind, Body, Spirit. Uh, where we would like to coordinate all these things related to um, perceptions and um, and uh, the, the spiritual dimension into musculoskeletal healthcare. We've already started and supervising a final year dissertation in Switzerland and in France, so there's a lot of things that can be done. And I'd like to thank my team at BMS. This is our uh, CPD, the CPD part, I would say, uh, with all this knowledge, oh, can we translate those uh, modern scientific aspects and um, traditional aspects into professional skills that can be useful for, for patients? So I'd like to thank you for your attention. It's quite weird. 
uh, talking alone here in my practice. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, you, got, you have my email just in case you have any questions. And uh, for those who are already here, we can start the chat with, uh, with you, Raymond. Thank you very much, Raphael. Yeah. This, uh, this whole subject of altered states of, of consciousness is really exciting. And a few years ago, I, I, I've read a lot about that. And I think it's an important part of what we do in treatment. I think we as, as osteopaths, we use altered states on ourselves. And the result of my master thesis was that to see that we also induce, with some techniques at least, we induce altered states of consciousness in our patients, which then might help them to get better and to feel better and what help with the healing. But before we get into that, maybe next week, uh, I'd like to uh, ask two questions regarding the history and the traditional uh, uh, Native American models, if, the, the, okay. if that's okay. Uh, what, 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 what I know from American traditions is they really like the number of four and a lot is organized by the four directions. and. And also in the model you showed, there were not just body, mind, spirit, but there were also the emotions. And why did the emotions disappear? Or did you just make it fit so it would go better with Andrew Taylor Still's model? Uh, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, the 2002 principles of osteopathy, they put body, mind, spirit. Mm -hmm. And like you said, all the, they all the tradition is run by four, you know, when they're doing a sun dance is four days, when they're doing an amblichea is four days. So they have the four direction, the fourth period, obviously. So they add these four components of, uh, of, of a human body. So I can't really say, I, I'm just describing my understanding mm -hmm. of uh, what is available because obviously uh, like I said, this is sacred medicine. So um, what one and all you, you can't if you go to this type of ceremony, you can't record anything. You can't uh, videotape. Obviously, why? Because this is something highly personal, and and uh, so it's it's and this is an oral tradition. You have to leave that, it, which is very different. From the modern approach, where you have you can learn by in books, then you can you learn by experience. You learn with intuition, and like you said, we've done that in in osteopathy for years. The thing is that without uh, an appropriate model, it was quite difficult for certain people to 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 accept this type of of practice, or at least it's easier to understand. You know, spinal manipulation, okay, you can hear something, you can see something, rather than just having someone touching the skull, closing the eyes for 20 minutes, and then the guy is going better. What happens? It's, it's difficult. So, so I don't know why uh, the emotion is not so uh, important. It is important, obviously, but mm -hmm. it's more in the biopsychosocial mm -hmm. model right away. Right now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, I, when, when still, I, I think there is only one point in Still's writings where he talks about body, mind, spirit, and he calls it the triune man. And the only other context where I've ever seen the word triune is actually the Bible with the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Do you think that, uh, that Still's uh, Christian tradition also had an influence here? Sure. I don't. I don't know. I, I, and um, again, I'm not an expert. You, you should ask this question to Jason. He mm -hmm. would probably give you tons of examples of pros and cons. Again, the purpose of our uh, paper and of our talk tonight is just to talk about the missing part that had probably a, a, a strong influence. On when when still designed and described the osteopathy for sure. So obviously there's a lot of he was a Freemason, he mm -hmm. was a spiritualist. He kind of 
he made his own mix. But most important thing is still alive today. Mm-hmm. That's so. It it, it it's well. It, it's a work for for an historian, and I'm not an historian. Mm-hmm. The other the other question or the other comment I had from an historian. Uh, was a, in a discussion I had with Christian Hartmann from Germany a while ago. You know, Christian, he translated all of Still's works into German. And he really, he also worked a lot with Jason uh, on historical documents. And he, uh, he's, he said that actually uh, Still in his writings, he repeats himself a lot usually. But this body, mind, spirit topic only comes up in one uh, in one book, in one uh, chapter, and usually still tries to avoid to discuss that part. I've, I have not studied uh, Still's writings uh, in, in, compare, in, a, uh, any, in anything cl- close to, to Christian Hartmann, so I have to believe him on that. Uh, what what are your thoughts about that? Have you looked at, at Still's writings and how often this comes back, or did you just go from the principles? I, I don't know. Like I've said, um, you should ask this question next week to Jane. Probably mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. she would be much. She has she has spent I, I, much more time at I the will, museum. I will. Than, mm-hmm. And again, to 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 answer very uh, simply, uh, Still did not. Uh, provide any uh, principles of osteopathy. Mm-hmm. They've done that only when he was yes. uh, after after his death. It, it was just to 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 maintain and to to for, it was for training purpose because you know if you if you read still it was quite difficult even 20 years later it's still difficult for me to read and to understand. Yes. It has and it has different level of of, of understanding from the most basic to the most I would say spiritual. So there's different degrees uh, for reading uh, still uh, still books. If you read that right after graduation, and if you read them after 20 years, probably you will see things differently. So and that's so I, I can't I can't really mm-hmm. re- answer. Obviously, he had a, his father was a was a pastor, so obviously he had a strong. Uh, education, but he was very, very open-minded uh, because you know I'm I'm talking to you, all of you guys tonight, saying, "Oh, he he went to the to live with uh, with the Shawnees, then he went back to to Kirkville." But you have to, to to keep in mind what was the it was the pioneer time, so there was uh, fights, there was warrior, his own grandfather was abducted by the Shawnee, you know, uh, there was, there was surplus, the, the Native American were, were surplus uh, people, they were not uh, respected, so um, that was a real uh, open mind um, people, just to come, live with them, to learn their culture, to learn the language, to learn that, to learn from their healing tradition, and then to, to move away. Yeah. Like he did for for uh, women, you know, that his first class you had women training as sociopath as was not so common. He was fighting against slavery, so that's that's that was the man, very open-minded and very uh, tolerant. Thank you. Let's check if there are more questions from the audience. Can we have the names? French members of the team of Cove. Someone is asking for French members of the uh, CAM collaboration team. Is it is it just you in France, or who else is uh, participating? Oh, I'm a member of the board of trustee, and I'm not related to the to the team. The this is uh, Agathe um, Agathe Bayergeau, who is uh, leading the, this team from from NACE, uh, from, the, from the National Promotional mm-hmm. Group. So we have a couple of uh, uh, colleagues, but I'm not involved uh, with them. Okay, I'm Peruvian. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> This must be nice to have to, to have to have two options, huh? Yeah, 
whatever suits better for me. So. <laughs> Good. So, thank you. For for anyone who wants to know more about uh, about the Come collaboration, I think the best, the, the easier thing would be to look up the website where where I think yeah, for you've, sure. you've got a list of all the people in the different departments and also in the different countries who yeah, are working yeah, for sure. here. Uh, this is an ear by mouth second hand question. Uh, do do you think an osteopath needs to needs to get sort of an initiation to be able to work on that BMS level and to help his patients in that area? I I don't know, uh, but this is a this is a, this is a good question because you know uh, in the Western world. Uh, anyone can become a doctor. You just need to go and learn in boost and you have experience. It's more the analytical brain. When you go to the traditional side of this aspect, there's no shamanic school, international shamanic school. You become a shaman. You, you don't ask to, to become a shaman. You, you go through life, to you. life experiences and then you get the initiation. And if we have a look, because I'm still on my uh, scientist cognitive bias, um, people, they, most of them, they have, of, if not all of them, they have awful lives, you know, with terrible events. So the brain has to, to, mm -hmm. to create coping strategies, and then they have initiation, and they can feel they've been through what their patients um, are, 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 are going. So in that sense, it could be interesting to see that, uh, I don't want to say mistake, but uh, Steele's first wife died. I don't know, I can't remember how many of his children died. This is something very, uh, well, very sad. So obviously, when you have, and, and that's, that's the importance of the spiritual dimension into healthcare, because when you're faced to such drama in your life, or when you're faced to disease like cancer, or when you are in, the, in your end of life care, you ask yourself questions. You never ask yourself when everything is fine, everything yes. is okay. Okay, and so this is the way um, that is the training. So osteopathy is in between. Obviously, we can ask people to go through awful things, get training. Osteopathy is in the Western world. So we can teach and, and through books, through experience, obviously. And uh, then you can have your own experience, but that would be in your on personal life, like I've done, okay, uh, when I was a patient. Obviously, uh, it has opened some neurons in my mind, so I can recognize. And if you have a look at the uh, the, the kinefin model, mm -hmm. the last part, the, the intuitive part, is about pattern recognition. So when you have suffered yourself from this type of things, you can you can feel, you can see it's easier for, uh, for patients to talk about, about this. So it, it improves the therapeutic alliance. Mm -hmm. So this way of, of thinking the therapeutic is not for everybody. Of course, I have patients, they just have back pain. They just want manipulation. That's all. And, and it's fine. Again, it's not a judgment. Uh, we need to be flexible in, the, in us to adapt our, our treatment to, to patients' requests. But some people who have um, chronic disease, they need to take pills every day for, mm -hmm. I don't know, for uh, what type of, of disease. So they don't feel like the other people. So why me? Uh, why now? Uh, what I've done? And mm -hmm. most of the time they can find uh, answer and relief uh, into the spiritual side. Thank you. Thank you. 
when when you talk about the kinefin model, I would like to I would like to use the occasion to uh, remind everyone of of Stephen Tyerman, who introduced this model to the uh, osteopathic yeah, profession that, uh, that ten years ago, uh, he, he, and who who is not among us anymore. But he he gave us a lot of really interesting inputs, and he made a lot of interesting bridges into other domains, cultural or uh, scientific. And I think we we will need another ten or twenty years to digest everything he he suggested as models. Mm -hmm. Good. I think we've reached the end of today's discussion. Thank you very much uh, again uh, to, to to bring bring us this interesting topic. I'm really looking forward to next Wednesday when we'll have uh, another evening and when it's, it will be about altered states of consciousness and modern neuroscience. Thank you very much. Tschüss. Have a nice rest of the evening. Thank you. Of course, we will have another preview on what's on in the next uh, couple of Cafe Still Point uh, streamings. We will start uh, next Wednesday with another uh, episode of our Embryologie Werkstatt with Erich Meyer Falli. And in this final uh, episode of the Embryologie Werkstatt, Erich will tell us a lot about how does all these embryology, uh, embryological knowledge, how does that apply to osteopathy? What are the osteopathic models where we use that most? What are the anatomical areas where this is most interesting to know and most helpful to know? Next week, uh, Raphael has already announced it <clears throat> on Monday, we will have an evening with Jane Stark from Canada. And Chain is one of the osteopathic colleagues who have probably spent the most time reading historical documents. She uh, spent a lot of time reading still and doing research on still's life and practice. And she wrote a book about still and his approach to fascia. Uh, more recently, she has worked on, on the life of Sutherland, William Garner Sutherland, and has just completed a book about his early years. So from Sutherland as a very young man until he, uh, through his training in Kirksville until the moment when he leaves Kirksville with his diploma in osteopathy. This will be the topic of next Monday. And again, we have the, uh, we have the history of the influenza epidemic, be, be, which will come in a little bit because apparently Sutherland had a very specific approach how he would treat this influenza in his patients. Uh, so come, come, come back next, next Monday for an interesting evening with Jane Stark. Again, this time it's not still, it's, it's Sutherland. And as we already said, on Wednesday next week, Raphael will be back here and we'll be talking more about the practice and the influence the body-mind-spirit model might have on our practice today and very recent neuroscientific research in that area. Thank you very much for, for joining us tonight. Schönen Abend, buenas tardes, au revoir. I hope to see you all next week or maybe already on Wednesday. Thank you.